conversation. The conversation is DMT. And of course, most people, when they think of DMT, the first thing you think of is ayahuasca. And we are going to be talking about ayahuasca, but we're going to be talking about how the potentials of that, the fact that there are brews very similar that have been used all over the world. So to begin, as you guys know, I've been doing a few talks lately, kind of preparing towards the Senator Cave. You haven't listened to any of them, but I've been doing talks, as you know, more from the Eastern perspective, talking about the Kundalini rising and the third eye. And we've had amazing conversations about altered states, etc. So to just plug us all in so that we're not going to feel lost, I just want to make a, quite a controversial statement. We now realize, I say we, people that are writing books and scholars and anthropologists and historians, especially religious historians, we now know that the one thing that unites all religions is so interesting. It's an altered state. Now, that sounds very obvious. But first of all, let's look what happens in an altered state. When you're in an altered state, a certain part of your brain starts to slow down. The part of your brain that gives you your identity, your juxtapositional sense of self. In other words, you're perceiving your world through the lens of you. And when you go into an altered state, that area of your brain starts to slow down and you see everything as a whole. And the spiritual experiences that are possible within that, in this Niagara of Epiphany's beauty in the dissolving of the self, you can access many things. And we spoke about in another talk where we've been talking about a lot about the pineal gland and the third eye. The idea is that these inner visions and ideas and thoughts are all based on something that Descartes called the seat of the soul, which is this little pineal gland inside your brain where inner visions activity, one could almost call it the inner internet of the cosmos. So I'm just plugging us into the conversations that we've actually been having up until now. Now, interestingly, how can you get into an altered state? Well, why it unites all religions is somehow from shamanism to every religion still on the planet, they knew this. How much they knew about why they were doing what they were doing, we don't know. But an example of ways of getting into an altered state are fasting, or dancing, music and drumming and movement, which I mentioned. Um, there are so many ways. Re repetition, chant, repetition. An example is a, a Catholic mama in Italy sitting with her beads, doing hundreds and hundreds of Hail Marys, going into an altered state and having some spiritual experience or Bushmen running and dancing around fires for nights and on nights or fasting. And I think you get the idea. So we've been speaking about that. And of course, what we're going to be talking about tonight is one of the most controversial and dynamically powerful ways that you can go into an altered state where this rod or the staff that is the spine that rises to this jewel can be almost coaxed, can be almost be forced, is through psychedelics. But we prefer to call them entheogenic, which means God within or God containing or, or God finding. So these entheogens are something that have emerged very powerfully in the last 10 years around the world. And for the most part, there are certain entheogens that are quite famous and they seem to be very established in certain areas. So we're going to be talking very specifically about a molecule, a certain entheogen, and this molecule, as we said, is DMT. Now, DMT, for most people, I'm not going to put unnecessary information here, is dimethyltryptamine, and it can be found in nearly every single animal and thousands, if not hundreds and thousands of plant species, which is quite extraordinary. And the reason, one of the many reasons we use certain plants when we actually create these medicines is because most plants and most human beings and most rats and have very low levels of dimethyltryptamine in. And we do know nowadays that DMT is responsible for imagination, for visions, for so many things. So it's an androgynous thing. And it's something that is naturally found. 
Now we use certain plants for the simple fact that some plants have a very high yield. And all that means is you could actually find DMT in seaweed. You can, and in grass, but you need kilograms of it to extract enough DMT to create any sort of a medicine. So that plugs us in kind of with an altered state and just the exciting idea of all these cultures thinking that they were so different, but essentially have always been doing the same thing through some form of initiation and ritualism, be it prayer, be it meditation, um, chanting, have basically pushed this aspect of the brain aside so the pineal can come alive, the cosmic aerial or perceiving things without you. So the next thing I want to say, I want to talk about just ayahuasca. Now, ayahuasca is a very specific word. And it's a word that is only used in certain parts of the southern, I mean, of the Amazon basin. So I want to make a suggestion. What I mean by that is there are many combinations of plants that are drunk worldwide. But let's just talk about the Amazon first. And they don't all use the same combination of plants. So in actual fact, for instance, in Colombia, I think it would be called Yage. And so ayahuasca, even in the Amazon basin, is not the only name for this. We're using ayahuasca because in the Western world, it's a name we know. So for us to understand the next 25, 35 minutes or whatever it is, I need us to consider something. I want to look at ayahuasca as a technology. So to be able to perceive ayahuasca as a technology and to open your mind to how the Egyptians were doing what they were doing, the technology of ayahuasca, although extremely complex in some ways, comes down to two things. It comes down to the fact that there are many plants in the world, and if you were to ingest it, the stomach will destroy this, um, this DMT, this molecule, and that's essentially a massive problem. But then there are other sets of plants which are absolutely incredible, which are called monooxidizing inhibitors. Now, what these plants do is they, I'm being very simplistic, otherwise we're not even going to get off the thing here, they actually slow down the level of serotonin that gets removed from your brain. An example would be St. John's wort, grenadella, um, there's a lot of them that can do it. Now, what's so incredible, why I want you to perceive ayahuasca as a technology, because a lot of people get very triggered by this, but even in Amazon, they use two combinations to create this technology. And that's the fascinating thing. So what I'm suggesting is if you have an MOI, which is what we call it, and you have a DMT source, and the two come together, and you make a brew with that, and you somehow know, or somehow figured this out. You know, Terence McKenna said it would have taken him with a thousand people in a lab. It would have taken him a hundred years to even figure it out. So that's a beautiful story in its own to try and research where the tribes think it actually comes from. So what we have here is this idea of a technology. I want you to perceive Earth, and I want you to perceive Earth covered in this incredible molecule that is just pretty much useless to us unless we find a sister. And the sister, as I said, prepares the stomach, allows the actual, um, I, I can't think of the word right now, the absorption, and without being destroyed, allows the DMT to go right into the brain, affect the synapses, and even activate the pineal gland. And usually, it would immediately be absorbed out. But because you've got the MOI blocking in the stomach and blocking in the brain, you have this experience. I mean, this is incredible. Well, we've been talking in the other talks about how DMT can be raised naturally. We're not having that conversation. We're talking about from a medicinal and an ethnobiologist kind of perspective. So there we have this technology. Now, as far as we know, we thought that ayahuasca is the oldest version of this medicine. And 
if we go back, the oldest version is 2130 BC. That's 4,000 years ago. And basically it was something found on a corpse in the South America. And there were your poor seeds in a pouch with a snuff thing. And your poor seeds just happen to be a way that you can take DMT that is generally blown up the nose. So we've got this incredibly long history. And the other thing that happened, as you know, is that the vine, which is one of the plants they specifically use, them, uh, organic to them, started to somehow spread around the world and facilitate, and it's found its way into every country. But while this was happening, many anthropological and religious scholars started to realize, starting with a few discoveries in Egypt, that the Egyptians were using DMT all along. Now, this opens a massive, massive, uh, even a rift, and the debate is booming. And the reason for that is they finding stuff that would date six to 8,000 years. So if you just want to only listen to the beginning of the talk, one could argue if you see ayahuasca as a technology that actually the Egyptians were doing it first. Now, it's a very bold statement. It's also a stupid statement because we know that the South American tribes do not, uh, did not uh, keep time. There's a specific word for the, the, the tribes. They don't keep time uh, the same way we do. And they also obviously didn't have a written tradition. But just right there, the fact that your brain goes, no, this can't be. So I know it's not actual ayahuasca as in that word, but the technology, the experience is very similar etc. So let's start there. That kind of plugs us into where we are. And can you imagine when these anthropologists first went to South America and started asking all these questions? Can you imagine if they had known that their religions themselves were actually littered with this very thing that they thought they had found in antiquity? So where we find ourselves is we're going to begin at Egypt. And before we speak about Egypt, I want to make a very bold suggestion, but I want you to research anything that I say for yourself. The reason I love talking about these things is I think you guys know, I just want to expand your mind. I want to excite you to just how big reality actually is. So e Egypt is for the most part uncontested as the birthplace of the three Abrahamic religions, actually on some of the biggest, most of the big religions in the world, including Christianity, Islam. And on top of that, unabridged Egypt is the birthplace of modern Western civilization as we know it. Now, I've been doing talks on emetics and on the secret schools, and I'm not gonna go back into that, but this is, this is absolutely known. The, begin, the first doctors were hermeticists and then went into the Greek mystery schools. And so most of what we know about alchemy, which became chemistry and medicine eventually became what it is today, came from Egypt. It's even a known fact that Pythagoras, and I could give you a list of them, they, even though they didn't live there, they went into the mystery schools in Egypt. I think he went for 10 years. So we're just getting an idea of whatever we're going to discover about Egypt, we need to know that Egypt has essentially influenced the entire world the way we understand it today. I think much of the history is lost, but we are talking about this epoch. So knowing this, where things get interesting now is one of the highest yielding DMT plants is in Acacia. And a few discoveries on... I'm not going to go into it. You can research it for yourself. I've, I've seen that even The Guardian, which is a British newspaper, has even recently, um, I, w I went to The Guardian just now and I researched this to find the article. This is how quick it is to look for yourself. They've even just written a thing that they found more DMT on one of the, uh, in the, one of the tombs. And, and what they're generally finding is it's an acacia, and we'll talk about it later, Syrian rue, which is, the money oxidizing inhibitor. So I want us to picture now that in all of, I mean, I've written down here, the Tamil, the Torah, the Bible, all these books, 
And all these religions have one very interesting thing in common. Their sacred plant is the acacia, which is mind blowing. Obviously we didn't know what we knew about DMT back then. And there's a very specific, um, it's acacia melodica that is the Egyptian uh, that, that grows pretty much all over there, but the Middle East, et cetera. Now this acacia is depicted in hieroglyphs, in tombs, I wish that I was very talented, that I could do like screen shares and videos, and I just thought it would be overboard. I want you to go and start looking at hieroglyphs and pictures, and the acacia tree is represented in all of the famous tombs. And of course, we never knew why. And I'm making a bold suggestion that we're starting to figure it out and that it had to do with DMT. And what's really interesting about that is if you look at Egyptian folklore, Osiris, I'm not going to get into who Osiris is, and otherwise we're going to get really sidetracked, but Osiris in folklore, and this is recorded on many, many tablets, and it's quite well known for anyone who studies their law. He was born underneath an acacia tree, okay? And later on in this whole cosmic story, their mythology, Osiris, where he is buried, they plant hundreds of acacia trees around him. There's this entire stone that shows it. And the legend goes that the trees sucked up all of his blood. And then they began to call the tree of life drink the blood of Osiris. That's how... What a mind-blowing story. And that's how, now that's probably just mythology. I doubt that, but you get the idea. That's how strong it was. And we, we're discovering this in these stories. So the blood of Osiris was essentially, what's really interesting is later on, you can get into the blood of Christ story and it gets quite mind-blowing. But let's just look. So that's Osiris on his own, uh, quite mind-blowing. The other thing that now that we know DMT is involved, that gets quite exciting the two plants they keep finding are native to that area. If you put them together, you get the most mind-blowing ayahuasca. To me, the, the most powerful medicine, in my opinion, that I've ever drunk, like as in the most special. But what gets quite fascinating about the story is then you start looking even deeper at their tablets. There, there are probably 10 books on the market about this at the moment, you start to discover that one of their main symbols was what's it called the eye of Ra, right? Yes, was the eye of Ra. And if you just picture the eye of Ra, today we are beginning to understand that the Egyptians very often did brain surgeries. It's proven. They often find esophaguses that you can see certain types of brain surgery. So these guys were a lot more advanced than we actually knew. About 50 years ago, they used to say, no, the Egyptians did lobotomies. Now, because of the complex work that they found done to the skull, they know they did full-on surgery. But what that tells us is in our limited knowledge, they knew a lot about the brain. And if you take the eye of Horus and you put it against a cross-section of the brain stem and the pineal gland, it will blow your mind. So what a lot of these authors are saying quite simply that the eye of Ra is literally a depiction of the brain, which the Bible talks about as well, and the pineal gland, and essentially this pineal gland being the seat of the soul, or the thine single eye, or, but it always comes down to, as we said in the other lectures, that you have two eyes, and then you have a single eye, and that eye is your spiritual eye. So it's quite actually mind-blowing, and what we do know is that most of the mystery schools, thousands of years before Christianity, that essentially to go into those mystery schools and to drink the tree of life elixirs and the blood of Osiris and things like that, you had to, such as Pythagoras, which wasn't as far back, they actually battled to get into these mystery schools. And you essentially had to prove your path to God. I mean, a fascinating thing, some of you have listened to my lecture on uh, cosmic law or hermetics. To study mathematics, astrology, which were all born there, you had to first be in absolute devotion to the divine. The idea was that higher knowledge 
should be protected by your eth your ethos, um, by your wisdom, things like that. And that's quite mind blowing because essentially thousands of years later, what we have is the search for knowledge or information and the search for God have completely separated. And we now have science and mysticism and they're on opposite sides of the table. But back then, to go into one of those mystery schools to, to get to know science was to get to know God at the same time. And later on, alchemy got ripped apart by us. And now we have chemistry and woo-woo stuff, according to people. Um, even astrology used to be, astrology and astronomy used to be a single subject, where the planets are and how they affect us. They ripped them apart after Egypt. Now we have astronomy where we stare at these objects and we have astrology and I think you get the point. So these mystery schools were absolutely incredible. And the preparation is the point I just want to put into your space. So I find that amazing. I mean, that's kind of puts us now. Now, if we to swing east, and I'm not going to spend too much time in the east because I've just done a talk on it. But if you look, for instance, I mean, at the um, Vedas, yes, the Vedas are known as the oldest spiritual texts that we actually have. And if you look at the Vedas, there are many, many examples of one of the most debated substances on the planet, and that is Soma. Now, anybody who says they know what Soma is has just read one book on it. On my shelf, I have entire studies and books where the one guy says it's cannabis and the other guy, they have no idea essentially what Soma was, but why it's such an interesting thing to think about is if you start to look at Hindu art, like anybody who works with DMT and looks at Hindu art does not need much to go, <gasps> wow. The, the link, just think of Kali and think of the beings with all the arms and think, and then go and look at modern psych, uh, psychedelic art of people that are taking DMT and seeing beings. And it's absolutely mind blowing. Now, whatever the Soma is, is one of the biggest mysteries in spirituality, because it was, it's said in the Vedas that it was the, I don't know the Vedas well, I've read many of the texts, but I'm going to paraphrase that it was the food of the gods, that it was God's essence. It was, and this is repeated right through the ancient texts, but somewhere along the line, and it's, I've got a book on it, but it's really confusing. They, 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 it was completely removed from society and we have no idea what it is. And in this discussion, the suggestion actually is because there are many plants in their areas, as in India and in the East, that can be combined exactly the same to create their version of ayahuasca, talking about it as a technology. So that's fascinating, just the possibilities. And where things get really interesting, if you wanna dive down the whole um, Eastern Vedic thing, I mean, let's not forget before we move on, what's one of the first things you see in the culture, right? The bindi. The bindi is once again pointing to what? Pointing to the single eye, pointing to the pineal gland, which is most easily accessed by DMT because it would not be considered a drug by a mystic advisor. So, and what's so interesting is if you look at what happened over the last few thousand years, it's something really worth looking into, but the the way that culture spread the Zoroastrians Zoroastrians then then spreads into Iran and a lot of the same plants keep showing up Syrian rue etc. But I'm not going to talk much about Iran or Islam just because I've only just started reading a book about the influence of potential influence of DMT on Islam. But I want to just make a suggestion to you again if you've ever used DMT. I want you to go and search. You could even do it now if you're on a computer. Go search Islamic temples and look at the roofs and tell me that that is not exactly how DMT exposes itself. Deeply, deeply similar. And we see it in Hindu, Hindu art. We see it. It's just mind-blowing. And I'm only touching on these things because a lot of these scholars, a lot of them are um, Hebrew scholars. They're not even religious people. 
are starting to put entire books together where they're actually tracking the potentiality of how DMT has actually been involved here all along. So for my part, I might be wrong. I might be right. I'm, I personally think Soma was some form of DMT. A lot of people argue cannabis. A lot of people argue some psilocybin, but it was a tea and it was a mixture of something, which is quite fascinating. And you, you, what we are noticing is regardless of what they were using, if you look at the Greeks, now why the Greeks have to be discussed at the exact same time is because ancient Egypt collapsed into Greece. In other words, Greece started to rise and a lot of the wisdom was taken out of Egypt into, this is known fact, right? And if you look at the ancient Greeks that literally started to then build uh, the empires as we know it, you know, a lot of our, our modern breakthroughs then, we're not sure how much of it came out of Egypt, but the Greeks sure perfected it. Even if you look in Greek culture, there was, mm, off my head, a Council of Elysium or something. What I, I had it. I can't remember. I think it, yeah, Elysium or something, but it's very well known. You can you can read about it, that they used to have these councils where they would get together and they would drink a, a kind of a, a mixture that, again, there's massive arguments about what that mixture is. There's another mixture that shows up in Greek history, which was kind of made from we know what it is, and the reason we know what it is is because they found so much ancient pottery with it inside. It was a kind of moss, ergo, yes. It was called ergot, ergot or ergo, which is also a psychedelic. Point being that we're now seeing that ancient Egypt, and we're seeing that the Greeks, that in, you, do you know that I read this morning that they took this Council of Elysium so seriously that a very famous Greek philosopher was executed in 400 uh, BC because of the fact that he had he had taken whatever the substance was in his own home recreationally, like at a party. He had decided the secret mixture that they had that they used to use, and the people that used the mixture in the Greek Council was the Parliament. So right at the head of making these decisions were psychedelics, undisputed. What's disputed is, was a DMT. So that's absolutely fascinating. So we, we had a very light look at the East and we've had a little bit of a look of how it spilt into Iran to the Zarathustans. I don't know enough of their names and things. They know who spread what. And, but where I think things are gonna be interesting is I want to talk a little bit about the Bible. So why this is interesting is, you know, a lot of the Bible takes place in Egypt and in that area. So it's the same subject. But as Westerners, Christianity and psychedelics are so far removed in the modern narrative. And there are scores of authors that are starting to prove that not to be so. So I'm just going to touch on a few things, especially DMT based. OK, so Moses, right? Now, again, do you remember, I like to talk about something that has influenced all the religions which Egypt has. When we talk about Moses and how, how DMT could have has literally influenced the entire world and has actually created all our religions, how can that be possible? We start with Moses, right? Please notice that Moses is a prophet to Christians, Ju uh, uh, Judeas, Judaism, Islam, so he was one of the core prophets that literally started everything, and we all have him in common. Now, if you look at Moses' story, right, Moses had this experience with the burning bush that literally changed history. And the burning bush, as you know, it was soon after that he went and wrote the Ten Commandments. Now, we do know that there is an acacia I mentioned earlier that is, grows all over and it is a very well-known fact to historians that during drought, it was not uncommon for these bushes to actually, or to some fires to actually break out. And if anyone has ever heard of Changa or smoking DMT, is knowing how much DMT there actually is in an acacia. If you had a massive acacia tree, this is what the Guardian wrote about this. It must have upset so many people uh, to be in a British newspaper but basically if you stood 
in the smoke of an acacia tree going off like that, you will have some transcendental experiences. Now, where people get upset is they like to go, oh, so none of this is real. And actually, it's all accidental. He tripped out. And no, absolutely not. I am suggesting that these are literally gifts of God, that they are in earth and that our ancient initiates, our ancient prophets, they knew it and they knew how to use it. And it's not because God is not real. This is an opinion because this is not a talk about doctrine, but because he has put a very specific, our creators put a very specific mechanism within us that through breathing, through anything, we can slowly climb the scepter and get to that part of our brain and fully understand. So what has this got to do with Moses? Well, Moses was he's standing in front of a burning acacia tree. If any of you tried that, you would be talking to God. And where that gets really, really fascinating is we're almost suggesting there, because then the Ten Commandments come soon after, we're almost suggesting then that in the Bible, a lot of the gods were birthed, and I mean in idea, in concept, and in doctrine, not in um, their origin, were birthed through Acacia. And what's really interesting is who else said the same thing? The Egyptians were very clear that Osiris was born of the acacia and he was one of their great gods so we're seeing this incredible similarity where this very quiet acacia tree that has been hiding under the radar for who knows how long is suddenly hmm and don't forget as i said in all those texts the acacia is the the sacred one so that's the one story that i wanted to tell you and i'm going to tell you one more about the bible that it, it's littered with them this one i know quite well because i've been reading about it for years Jacob, right? Jacob, again, shared by, these are like the original cedars of all these religions that later off break, break off and come up with their own versions and ideas. So now I don't know the verses very well, but I know that at one stage, I'll give you a core verse and you can go look before. But at one stage, Jacob asks his wife, it's quite clearly written, there's nothing cryptic. He asks, woman, where are my marigolds? Now, you can go research what a marigold is, but that's a psychedelic plant. And quite a bit of a, a complicated story. I didn't really understand the whole thing. But point being, later on, Moses, in the, one of the most famous scenes of all time, climbs up the proverbial stairs to heaven and tries to look God in the face and essentially wrestles with God wrestles as he tries to survive what he's seeing and God spares him and I won't know this so far heart Genesis 32 30 and Jacob named this place Peniel I mean come on and further and then he explains the verse is quite long I have seen the face of God and survived so now think about that talk I did where I explained that all the levels of the spine are levels of initiation, according to the hermetics, and got the Hindu saying the same thing. We've got uh, yogi saying the same thing, that you've got chakras, and slowly your kundalini rises, and eventually it hits thy single eye, and, and you hit some form of rapturous enlightenment. Now we are literally talking about the fact that Jacob openly spoke about his experiences, but he said 33 stairs. Oh, you've got 33 you get what I'm saying, and that's why you can't just do one talk. You've got to you've got to look at the subject from a few angles. But he called it Peniel. I mean, come on, he went and met God in Peniel. It's spelt. I don't know if it's been translation. It's spelt one letter differently. So that's Jacob for you. I mean, yeah. And when we were talking about the Greeks and there's a Lucia. A, a, illusion uh, mysteries or council the other thing that's interesting is the greeks have have a native acacia which apparently was used that is also very high in dmt and the other thing that comes up and shows up in these brews that they were drinking is they think it was exactly the same as the egyptians which is acacia and syrian rue and this is the reason they think it Let's look at the Greeks as kind of like the birth of medicine and stuff like that, even though we know it came out of Egypt, but they implemented it, right? It's a known fact that in a lot of their medications and medicines that the first doctors made, they constantly used 
extracts of acacia. This is known and Syrian rue. An example of Syrian rue can even be used to induce childbirth. So it's it's like it's a very, very complex, beautiful plant that I believe is the one that the Egyptians were using to mix to create this incredible technology that they call tree of life that I'm calling ayahuasca as an adenum. So I, actually, let's do I one. I didn't more. catch that. Could you try again? Sorry, shouting at me. Let's do one more. Let's talk about Jesus. Okay. Now we don't know this as deeply, but this is kind of where they are now. Um, in the book that I was reading about three months ago, a guy was saying that little known fact so first of all, John the Baptist, I think it was his cousin, right? If you look at how Hebrew scholars are, and rabbis are describing um, who John was, um, no, it was a Hebrew scholar. I can't remember his name, such an interesting guy. They were describing that John was far more like a shaman. And if you look at the definition of kind of what he did and how he behaved and he was an outcast, and, but he was actually the shaman. Now, what's interesting, what this guy points out in his book is, and I've researched this in other areas now, that baptism around that time and that was involved with John, baptism was actually a very scary affair. They did not dip you underneath the water. It is contested that in actual fact, when John the Baptist actually baptized people, that they were forced under the water to the point where they actually faced like that feeling of losing life. like. It's fascinating. Now, why this comes up is because um, they begin to realize that Jesus had a series of altered states, right, according to this, and they believe that that was one of the first ones. If you're not sure what that has to do with anything, it is a known fact that at birth or near death experiences, your DMT starts to spike. So that's where things get interesting. Where the story gets even more interesting about Jesus. Now, once again, we're not saying, first of all, that you have to believe in Jesus. I'm talking historically. We're talking about altered states. We're not saying that God or his connection to God or anything came from these things. We're just talking about what kind of altered states they might be using or were using that we didn't realize. An example is now we also know, as we discussed in the beginning, that fasting is one of the most powerful ways to slowly rise your DMT, especially if you've got the guts to fast 20 days and beyond. And we also know that after Jesus was baptized, he then, in one of the most famous accounts of visions with God and the devil, went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights without eating. And again, there we see, ah, Jesus using altered states and having those visions and those experiences. So it's quite mind-blowing. And you could feel a little bit suspicious that maybe Jesus didn't know about the pineal gland or the third eye. And it's really, really silly because in actual fact, he was a master at it because there's a quote. He didn't say many things directly in the Bible, right? Um, but there is a quote. Uh, let me see if I can find it for you guys. So, yeah. Matthew 26, 2. Jesus says, if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. So now, again, what we realizing here is right across all these traditions, they all keep talking about the single eye. How this has taken us so long to figure out is actually quite scary. The Hindus, the Buddhists, they all point to this. They all accept that there is something at the top of the brain. Uh, our philosophers, Descartes, calling it the seat of the soul. He was a Westerner. He had nothing to do with mysticism. And here we go, Jesus with a quote saying, I repeat, if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. So it's quite amazing. And before we start closing off, I want us to just also something that's very controversial, um, huge debate that's going on in Israel at the moment is, do you guys know, do you remember the word manna? Now in the Bible, I don't remember the whole how it was worded, but God essentially promised the people kind of to sustain them through a really, really difficult period that manna would appear would essentially be given like food from God, which is quite interesting because entheogen is literally that. 
And in the story, the, the manna would appear upon the first dews of the morning and would begin to rot by that evening if it wasn't taken. So there are so many people that are saying those were psilocybin mushrooms. And um, that that part of the story is just absolutely mind-blowing. It's, uh, it's incredible. And I suppose what comes to mind is if there were so much of this information in the Bible, and if all of these sacred texts, including the Egyptians, including the Greeks, with all their, their gatherings and their secret initiations, why is it that we don't know this? Well, it's a known fact that if you're not sure how Christianity came about, right, you can research this for yourself, but there was no Christian faith. I mean, there was that was created in 350, I think, 350 uh, AD after Jesus' birth, and it was called the Council of Nicaea, and um, the Council of Nicaea Basically, and you can Google it, Council of Nicaea, what was it? It's the birth of Christianity. And basically what happens is they put thousands of books on a table and the Emperor Constantine decided that he was going to create a central narrative for Christianity. And they debated, I don't want to tell you too much of the story, you're going to think I'm making it up. They debated what books to put in there. And if you actually hear how some of the books were picked, they eventually got to the stage. This is well written about. They got to the stage. There were so many books that Constantine believed that God would guide him. And they would sometimes just leave the books as they were. And they would pick up just the books on top because he said God had guided. But what's mind blowing is that many years later now, some of those books that were never actually kept in the Bible have come out and they are saying completely different things, not to the Bible, but they are suggesting a deeper level of mysticism and esotericism. So why I'm bringing this in is most people agree that Constantine decided to remove esoteric or mystic sides to Christianity in 350. And that was the construction of the new Bible as we know it. And that is very interestingly, the Gnostics, if any of you know, the Gnostics still exist. They are Christians. The Gnostic Christians um, believe that that's where psychedelic um, information was basically wiped out. So yeah, fascinating. So kind of bringing us to our close here is I just want to talk about one more thing from the Bible, actually. Why acacia, how to prove to you that acacia is actually so sacred, right? So we spoke about the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments were he was he was commanded to put it inside a container or an ark, right? The ark was made of acacia, okay? And the ark then, I believe, goes to be stored in this uh, temple of Solomon originally. And the temple of Solomon, I can never remember his name was actually built by Heron. Now, this to me absolutely blows my mind. Now, before we talk about why Heron is so important, is it was re 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 really, uh, revealed later on in the Bible during letters to, hmm, I, didn't, I didn't write that down, but later on in the Bible in letters to, I can't remember, basically it explains what's in the ark. So you can Google Bible what was in the ark. So what was in the ark? Apparently, according to the Bible, because as you know, everyone debates this, there was Aaron's staff, there was um, the Ten Commandments, the original tablets of power, and there was a bottle or a chamber of manna. You can see why it's so important to figure out what manna is. And if these guys are right, and manna was psilocybin, they literally mean that in the Ark of the Covenant, that they put that in there as a technology for spiritual, if that makes any sense. So that's mind blowing. So this goes to the king's, uh, I don't want to tell you too much of the story, but goes to Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple is built and designed. They say the design was cosmic. There's a beautiful story in the Bible about how it was done and there's other stories. But I want you to imagine like a building that just everything about it made cosmic geomographic sense and built by Heron. And in the story, in the Bible, three men, while the Ark of the Covenant is there, somehow break in and get hold of Heron. They think they torture him. 
They're not sure what they were looking for, but people now say it was for the secrets of what was in there. And they killed him. And the reason why this story is important is Heron is considered, okay, so he had the secrets of psychedelics, basically, and the, the Heron is considered the godfather of the Masons. And that is a very, very important conversation for one reason, because the last thing I want to leave you with before I want to just talk practically and I want to bring you guys into the space is that's now all of this happened. I want to finish off and it would take me another half an hour to explain to you why. There are books around at the moment that argue very, very strongly that even the Constitution of America was written via uh, ceremonies using DMT uh, inner technology. Now that sounds crazy, but if you want to go do a little bit of Googling for anyone who's making notes, here on, first of all, they create the Freemason, Freemasons and anyone want to guess what the main symbol of the first Freemason symbol ever released is. It's a single eye, thine eye be single, and it is an acacia tree around it. Oh, when they buried Heron in the Bible, they wrote nothing on his tombstone. They simply put a single branch. This is in the Bible of an acacia tree. This is, oh man, this is a story and a half. So the Masons, to finish, because I'm not going to go into modern history, to this day have an eye on absolutely everything, as you know. I do not personally believe that the Masons were fallen. I, I'm not sure if they are today. I think it's a strong possibility. I really don't know. But I do believe, do you guys know that it's a known fact that Abraham Lincoln, all of those guys were Masons? It's, it's like a known fact. It, it's, and if you read about what we know about the Freemason Masonic Lodges at that stage, you can go and search about the fact that they called it first matter in ritual is the acacia brew. I can't remember what they called it, but they used to drink a brew made of acacia in the Freemasons. And in this guy's book, he argues that all of them that were writing the constitution, that they were part of these rituals and to get to a certain level, you had to drink this thing. And that the way the con constitutions of the modern world came about was, as you know, from ancient Egypt, they taught us that there are cosmic laws and that it was the human beings trying to find a way to express cosmic law in a way of physicality. In other words, to almost support God. That's the best way I can put it. And they put together the constitution of the Amer uh, United States. Never mind if you look at how advanced the Greek um, political system was getting underneath these auspices. So it's a lot. And I've, I've, just, I've just scattered along. But this is, this is what I want to kind of leave you thoughts with, is that the realization that this completely natural substance that is found all over the world has a secret kind of mix that has been mixed in different ways through different plants, all having a very similar response. And as you know, in this modern world, there's a really big argument about the anthropomorphic morphopization, yes, my words, of cultures, in other words, stealing cultures. And a lot of healers, for instance, call it in Africa, like that are, are studying comedics and things like that and realizing how much Egypt has influenced the world. Long story short, we're actually realizing, I mean, for instance, I, I serve a tree of life brand in ceremony, and it is essentially it is essentially just two plants that they were using. And if you have this experience, it is absolutely mind blowing, not unlike ayahuasca, but the potentiality for African um, healers and traditional healers in the realization that to use these magnificent tools, they have them right here on their doorstep. And my favorite thing about it is it just puts such a kick in the face to everyone who's trying to argue that someone owns these technologies. And now that we know that these technologies have been used all over the world, how are we going to argue for using it in a specific way? And we're going to discover, just like in religion, where we have um, commitment to the deity or to the divine, we're going to discover that at the basement level, with all these kinds of ways of doing this, they all actually agree on the basics. 
the preparation, the cleansing, the detox, the space, the intention. And I just think it opens massive possibilities. It's quite interesting because if you look at um, ayahuasca, so supposedly the feminine energy, which are just archetypes that we use to try and explain the impossible. It is said that the mother will tell you what it is that she thinks you need to know. The mythology of the tree of life or the acacia, even written in the Tamil, is that acacia will tell you the truth only. So there's a harder energy to it. Some say masculine, but the truth only. So then some people say to me, does that mean that ayahuasca lies? No, not at all. But anyone that's an ayahuasca uh, um, facilitator will tell you to not take it too literally. It's going to show you exactly what it is you need to heal like a mother would. It will tell you a version of the story that will help you embrace it. But the warnings in the sacred texts about acacia were speaks direct. Like, are you ready? to hear this. And that's why I believe that um, it was in the mystery schools. And so there is a possibility that this technology of ayahuasca, which we fondly know mostly anchored in South America, has actually built the modern world as we know it. And the fact that it's found in the brain and the fact that everyone agrees in all cultures about the single eye is quite mind blowing. In South America, it's represented by the snake. Even Buddha had a snake behind him that used to come over him that could no longer hurt him. And the snake obviously represents the rising of this Kundalini. So yeah, that leaves us at this point. Um, I hope for your sake, you get to experience um, drinking a, an African combination one day, this tree of life mix, it's, it's magnificent. Um, but like with all sacred medicines needs to be approached with absolute reverence, you know? And I know there was a lot of information and I only want you to take what works for you and if it doesn't ring true for you or if you feel that it is disempowering in some way I want you to throw everything I said away and search in areas that are more empowering for you and um, with that I'm going to stop this recording uh, first of all and I'm going to allow anyone that